But before we start off, let me introduce the panel that we have here this morning. To my extreme left, I have Dr. Sam Kamau, who is a lecturer at the Aga Khan University. Uh, good morning and thank you for joining us. We also have Kokyo Cheng, who is also a lecturer at the University of uh, USIU, uh, United States International University. And last but not least, we have Evans Wafula, who is a journalist. Thank you for joining us, lady and gentlemen. And we'll dig in straight into what we have on the dailies this morning. Uh, but before that, let me just start with a look at uh, the question that we are running this morning. And do you think members of parliament are representing public interest on fuel tax? Do you think they're representing public interest on fuel tax? The hashtag is KTN Morning Express. Um, KTN Morning Express. And uh, if you'd like to tweet, it's at Michael G. Gitonga or the Twitter handles that are going to be displayed as we carry on with the show. So the question, do you think members of parliament are representing public interest on fuel tax. So we'll be looking at your comments as we go along. But let's go to the dailies and we start off with the headlines. MPs firm on zero tax even after meeting with Uhuru and Raila. This, of course, is after uh, the Speaker of the National Assembly tabled the proposal from the President to increase tax levy uh, uh, on tax um, on fuel rather uh, from 16%. Uh, it came down to 8%. It's an increase on all the same, but members of parliament, well, saying that they're going to defy their leaders and that they will go for zero uh, VAT on fuel and petroleum products. Let me throw it to you, panel, and let me start with you, Dr. Kam uh, Sam Kamau, on um, whether you actually think they will pull this off. <laughs> <laughs> now, a course, difficult one, eh? It's a difficult one uh, because uh, apparently they are unpredictable because. Uh, on one side and uh, over the weekend you saw them uh, saying different things. Mm. Then yesterday after the two meetings, even though they appeared unconvinced, uh, there was that statement that they would actually support the initiative of the president. But I think it is the realization uh, they are under extreme pressure from the Wanjiko in terms of the public outcry. Now these uh, cries are getting to the MPs, they are under pressure, but on the other hand, now caught up between, uh, you know, the... the Pleasing the, the, their... The, yeah, their party leaders. Mm. But I think one of the things that uh, they have to remember is that uh, they owe allegiance to Wanjiko, who elected them to represent their interest. The second thing, the constitution actually defines what is expected of them as MPs in terms of representing uh, Wanjiko. So putting these two considerations in mind, they should actually do the right thing mm. uh, in terms of considering, yes, the proposal that the president has put forth, but also seeing what is in the best interest of the people. Although in all honesty, Wanjiku has cried many times and oh. members of parliament sometimes have played a deaf ear. So what would be different about Wanjiku's cry this time? Perhaps also because uh, some of these uh, provisions also directly affect the MP and never underestimate the humans, you know, human beings' capacity for self-interest. Mm -hmm. So there's something also that is uh, pinching them and therefore in that, in that sense they, they may be tempted, you know, inclined to uh, listen to Wanjiko a little bit more. Although the pressure and the organization that you saw uh, yesterday, because you have to admit the government is struggling mm. uh, to raise money to meet its obligations in terms of debts and also some of the promises they have made. So that pressure, they will continue feeling it today uh, before they make the decision. And they say the devil is in the details, so maybe that pressure is not so much from Wanjiko, but from the fact that uh, the austerity measures would also affect them if that money is not available. And maybe I could throw in I suspect they actually haven't read uh, the memorandum properly, you know, what came from the president, to fully understand the implications, because if they do, it will be an easier decision. Okay. Let me come mm -hmm. to you, Koki. And uh, same mm -hmm. question, do you think members of parliament will pull this off once we've rarely seen them uh, go against their party leaders? And we've seen now Raila Odinga and Uhuru Kenyatta whipping their parties to say, look, this is the direction we need to take. Mm -hmm. I'd like to look at it uh, as a you know, green-hedged maze where people are running in, politicians are you know, maneuvering in mm. to determine uh, their position per se. Uh, and uh, of course it's an indication of how the handshake will roll out and uh, whether the leaders are really as strong as they claim to, as they are perceived. Want to make us think. Yes, and the impact they will have on those decisions. Mm -hmm. And of course, by is it five o'clock or maybe midnight today, we'll be able to see who will really stand out and uh, go against what has been proposed. Mm -hmm. But then again, 
what are the implications of uh, going against it? Maybe that's an, another question that we'll have to ask. We'll have to ask. Okay, yeah. Paul Wafula, your thoughts? Yes. Evans, Wafula, Evans Wafula, yeah. Sorry, Evans Wafula. Uh, basically, from what I saw yesterday is that uh, it was sort of spectacular bipartisan approach by members of parliament to support President Uru's uh, tax proposals. For me, I look at it as both uh, submission and betrayal. Submission in the sense that, uh, of course, the handshake playing in and politician, the way we know them, is that they're also saying that uh, the constituency development fund seems to be also under threat. So probably one of the things is that there must be a compromise that if you support this, then we will offer also to safeguard the CDF. But also uh, betrayal in the sense that the living standards, if you really look at uh, the living standard in the country, is that actually the normal mwana inchi is really suffering. I think this 8% that we are talking about, does, it's only on petroleum products. But people do not actually understand that it also affects other, you know, someone who goes to buy just a, a, a packet of unga or maybe buy other commodities in the shop really feels the tax uh, the, 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 tax the, the weight that the, the tax of the is tax. going to put so on. So I think uh, as much as I can see it is that there's both submission and there's also betrayal. So probably as we know politicians are hoping that now there's no bribery as they normally say. <laughs> I, I hope that maybe they're actually uh, going to support this not because of anything. Because remember this, what is happening is political economic. Mm -hmm. It's both political and economic in the sense that when you talk about these measures that are putting in place to cushion the government, we're looking, you can look at it purely as politics and economics. So I think maybe they're, they're much informed by some, some, some submission and betrayal. They're okay, actually and, the one and, and, and I know you're all journalists and look at things from a journalistic point of view, but uh, let's think politically a little bit here. And Dr. Kamau, do you think this is a negative effect of the handshake? Because we, where we are coming from, uh, we probably would have seen a very vibrant, very strong opposition that would have made sure or would have been very loud and vocal that this is not <laughs> going to happen. However, now we already have uh, members of parliament from NASA who met their leader and they said they will support the bill, but only for a year. So are we seeing a softening of the opposition from the handshake? Uh, I think the opposition is dead after the handshake. I think we just need to acknowledge that. Eh? Now, the handshake was supposed to serve a very specific purpose, bring down the political tensions. But I guess the president may have realized that the handshake is more useful. You know, when, leverage when, when, when he said he has, he has a very deep understanding with uh, Raila Odinga, maybe this is part of what uh, he was implying. Because you would expect the opposition, at least the, 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 the members of parliament, you know, from the Jubilee side, you would expect that the government would, you know, whip them in line uh, because it's part of what, you know, you would say government agenda and therefore they would be expected to support mm. that. But for the opposition, because you remember, they were actually the first ones to come out, you know, and, and indicate, you know, give the, will indicate the willingness to support the proposals by the president. Mm. The only thing that doesn't make sense is they are saying they are supporting this for a year, because once these things pass uh, and, they, and they become, they will not have that opportunity to reverse these things they are saying. So in a sense, we are suffering because of the handshake, the because handshake. now the opposition is not able to take up uh, its proper role uh, in terms of, uh, you know, being the voice uh, that is able to oppose or even speak out against some of the proposals that are seen to be harmful to Wanjiko. Okay, and Koki, uh, we certainly cannot underestimate the strength and the power of the handshake, especially at the time that it happened, given that it brought down political temperatures and made people, you know, somehow feel like there was a semblance of peace. But could this have a very negative effect with time, especially economically speaking? I think uh, basically what we are seeing is, uh, like uh, Dr. Sam says, opposition doesn't exist. I mean, once there was the handshake, once there was half the country not voting during the October elections, it's a statement to say that uh, really whatever happens, happens, and therefore they, they really wouldn't care so much what goes on. And uh, they would give prom promises that probably will not work. And uh, I believe what they listed down as the requirements or the, um, the, the measures required for them to keep the tax in place. It's just a list that maybe they will lobby the government to undertake, but I don't see so much difference in what they have lobbied before in terms of what they need to, I mean, 
to, to stand for the, the tax as it is. Okay. Uh, the bottom line is that Kenyans are going to be taxed and overtaxed and taxed and there is really nothing much we can do about it except, you know, have some citizen, you know, kind of awareness and consciousness that we need to step up our means mm. to, to kind of voice our concerns our about concerns. issues. And that brings me to page six of uh, the standard. And maybe I want us to look at this now, maybe just from a different perspective. There is a uh, headline here, Brace for Tough Times as Budget Cuts Unfold. Now, looking at it from uh, your profession, from you know the newsroom perspective, oh. Wafula, do you think we have done a good enough job on informing the electorate what this tax, uh, this, this uh, fuel levy it means to them, mm -hmm. and possibly whether our members of parliament have played their part? Because here we are now with them saying that they're going to veto the president's proposal. However, they're the same people that passed the budget. That budget did go through their hands, and they're the same people that passed it with the 16% actually uh, as part of what was going to raise the funds. But anyway, looking at it now from your perspective, have we done a credible job in informing the electorate on the meaning of this VAT and what, it's going to, what, what the ripple effect is going to be? I, I think uh, we've not done quite uh, a lot of service. You're I, not satisfied? I'm not really satisfied so because, for example, we are really talking about what politicians are saying and how many people, for example, drive uh, motor vehicles in this country. There are poor people who, who know that the, the price of fuel would actually affect their lives. But they are not actually being told about the small commodities that would actually be uh, uh, affected if the f f uh, fuel prices go up. I would imagine that we have done that. We've, oh. we've, we've literally gone to the supermarket and be, said, this be, is how much it costs now. This is how much it's likely to cost be, after. Be, because because if, you, if you go to rural uh, areas, for example, if you go to even my village, mm. when you talk about the f uh, price of fuels, people seem not to understand. And I know we have to be very honest with ourselves that... Uh, the way we are in this country is that there are people, the, the middle class has really risen up. We've got a huge middle class, which of course would understand what we mean when you, when you report. But if you go to the local person who is actually a, a peasant, who does not understand how the price of fuel will affect, actually they are even having more problems than what you are talking about, the fuel prices. Their corruption has really affected their lives in the sense that they are talking about prices of maize, they are talking about uh, sugar, they are talking about things that have been there and that they have not seen any effect, unemployment and, and, and many other. But when you talk now about the, the price of fuel and not actually try to make sure that somebody who is down there can be able to understand how it affects. I mean, if you go to my village, there's no supermarkets, mm -hmm. that people will go there and understand that uh, the price of fuel has affected a commodity in the supermarket. Okay. People really need to understand that. How the, and, and that's why we have left it. The, the politicians have hijacked this all problem about uh, the, 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 the rising cost of living because they have politicized it. Now you see like yesterday what was happening is that the, when the political divide, there's a political divide among the, the people in the opposition and people in the government in who will support what, who will not support what. That then leaves people also not to understand because if politicians or if members of parliament are direct representatives of the people and yet they come with certain positions when it comes to this kind of uh, 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 taxes, then it, it leaves the, 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 the local person not to be able to understand okay. clearly. Mm -hmm. Koki, do you agree that uh, we have not uh, explained to the electorate exactly what this means and especially mm -hmm. the role of the member of parliament in this whole regard? Who slept on the job? Mm -hmm. I think uh, the norm is in our society given that uh, we, we have that idea of dependency or uh, the two-step flow approach. And let me just go theoretical. Mm -hmm. I think that if the middle class is, uh, is more conversant with what is going on, they hold conversations with people who are in the rural areas and kind of break down information for them. So in a sense that uh, probably in talking about corruption, it has been so vivid, but uh, in conversations about taxation and uh, ones that you'd have with people in the village, just explaining to them the implication, mm -hmm. it would still have an impact in the way it has gone. I, I would like to loud the, the media for this po at this point from an outsider's point of view because uh, I remember going through the same kind of recession mm -hmm. during the Kibaki era and we still remember during the Moi area uh, era after the um, SAPs were they the SAPs mm -hmm. so I think the media has really gone out to explain in depth I even in saw uh, a clip when I was uh, away about uh, you know breaking it down 
on television what this means. What and I, be I believe those TV stations are being watched right deeply into the rural areas. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Kamau? Largely, yes. Actually, um, I would say, uh, even if I won't say I'm satisfied, I would say largely the media has done a commendable job in terms of, uh, number one, keeping this uh, debate and discussion alive. Mm -hmm. Maybe the only concern would be, because you see with the VAT, the 16% VAT when it came on board, mm -hmm. it was actually dissected, discussed on different platforms, eh? broken down uh, in a good way. Mm -hmm. My only concern would be linking this to the wider, you know, the big picture and the connected issues because you are talking about uh, you know government planning, you are talking about uh, discipline, uh, fiscal discipline. We have even started now, you know, revisiting the issue of uh, debt and managing debt, you know, and all those things. The only thing is, uh, for example, there was too much focus on the 16% VAT without also now looking at the background until somebody actually, I think it was the journalist, eh, who came out and said this problem started in 2013, trying to, you know, provide that background that would help us understand how did we get here. But in terms of keeping this conversation alive, uh, you know, bringing panels that are able to interrogate these issues, commentary I've seen in newspaper. I think the media has largely done a good job. They've done a good job. Yeah. All right, and uh, just before we move away from that, an interesting story here uh, where a woman has gone to court. We're talking about the handshake. Woman sues over Uhuru Raila deal, and uh, there is a woman in court uh, who basically has uh, gone to sue, uh, you know, Raila and Uhuru. Well, not just them, but the fact that the Building Bridges Initiative or the team that was put together cannot you know, propose constitutional change. Um, and I don't know whether this will see light of day and how that is going to go, but maybe just to get your brief comments on that, on a lady going to, and, and, and also just looking at our, uh, our you know, judicial space that people have gotten to a point where literally you can go to court and, you know, raise any issue that you feel uh, as a, uh, you know, as a Kenyan, you have maybe been uh, devoid of the rights, uh, Dr. Kamal. Well, uh, first I think, uh, like I said, the, uh, the handshake was a political process that was meant to uh, calm the tensions. And uh, the other thing, of course, uh, is that out of that, uh, it needed to be anchored, uh, you know, in, in some, some kind of a structure and in, 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 in the law. Mm -hmm. Now, some of these, uh, the task force that was put together is supposed to basically look at the broad issues that were discussed and agreed upon, you know, initially uh, out of the handshake. But whatever recommendations they come up with eh, is now supposed to be handed over to the institution that are tasked, you know, and mandated by law, if it requires to change the constitution, if it requires to change certain laws, if it requires certain changes to be made, then it is the, you know, the, the, the institutions that are created by the law. So I don't think this is necessary at this point <clears throat> in terms of trying to, you know, make, challenge the legality of the of the deal, all that. I think I would say we would need to wait until this task force is able to give recommendations and see those ones that would now require parliament either to take over the process and now move us forward. One. All right, uh, Koki, your uh, <laughs> thoughts on, you know, opening up of our judicial space to a point where Kenyans literally, I mean, Omkia um, Omtata so far has been the oh. one who represents all Kenyans, <laughs> but it looks like anybody can walk into court and raise any issue and will be heard. I think my first contention is the, heady, uh, the, the, um, the headline, mm -hmm. woman. <laughs> uh, is there a name in that story? Uh, yes, there is a name. Yeah. Is a, I think job. that is my first contention. I mean, mm -hmm. why woman? Why not just the gender-blind approach and uh, say Okorata <coughs> or a Kenyan? Or a Kenyan. You know, that would be my first <laughs> indication. Mm. But I think the... Miss Gesicho is her name. Yes, Gesicho, yeah. Mm. Madam Gesicho, Miss mm. Gesicho goes to court. I mean, when you say woman, <laughs> of course it gives a gender dimension. I mean, that I feel that is not uh, really, really responsive to where we are moving towards. Mm. Uh, the fact that Kenyans... Um, are, are able to go into the judicial uh, space is recommended mm -hmm. and uh, it is a it is a trend that is going upwards if i feel that there's an injustice and i can do something about it then i'm likely to you know go out there and uh, follow due process and make sure that uh, a ruling is done without feeling inhibited but that is not to just um uh, to look at it from just uh, that narrow perspective mm -hmm. in real sense if you look at um, uh, how citizen engagement has been reported, and I am yet to do that study, which is online. I think the citizen has woken up to the understanding that they can play a role in governance, mm -hmm. in uh, change of laws, in constitution, without 
really been you know guided per se by pol the political class mm -hmm. i think there is a movement and it's, we can say a citizen movement informal in every region in every county that has come up with a way to uh, you know uh, air their opinions about governance about what should be done and even just go to court be having the courage to go to court and deal with issues that they think are of social injustice. All right, uh, Evans, your comments on that. Uh, I think uh, judicial activism is uh, in matters of public interest uh, is not a new thing in Kenya. And um, my hope is that uh, probably it will get somewhere. But it's important also to note that uh, uh, her, whatever she's going to seek in court, you, you know very well that it's not very new and it's not extraordinary for political the ruling party engaging with the opposition, especially after election, for the betterment of everybody in the country. And, and Raila has been very clear that the opposition is still intact and he's still in the opposition. Whereas also the president side has said that uh, they're they are in government. So it's very also, we will have to see actually what, what, what she really seeks to, 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 to find, to, to get for, out of this uh, uh, suit. But most important is to know is that, um, as uh, my <coughs> colleagues have said, is that uh, the political element of this uh, unity was actually to ensure that the entire country is united. Right. Whether that will be as, as, be, as been achieved or will be achieved is also an act thing for us to, to see what, what the ruling will be like. All right, and uh, maybe I would want us to finish off with a cartoon on page 14 of The Nation. That's page 14 of The Daily Nation. And uh, just so that you can see this while they are getting that <coughs> done, it's, uh, well, the president is holding a basketball which has 8% written on it. We have a hand there that is written greed. I think that represents the members of parliament and uh, our salaries never enough those of similar opinion defending say I and let me just give you the cartoon for you to have a look at it and just give your comments because I find sometimes cartoons are very uh, they communicate a huge message a very um, what would I call it resounding message but in a rather humorous manner so let me start with you Dr. Sam as we conclude on that cartoon I think the one thing uh the cartoon you know is trying to capture you know capture or depict is um the president of course has his goal uh to achieve you know raise more money to fund the government projects but now will greed you know among the mps the stand in the way of that <laughs> wow meaning they could actually be stopping it for their own they actually have the ability to stop this but will greed allow them will grant greed allow yeah. I waffle at your thoughts <laughs> <laughs> this this is only happening in, in countries or regimes that are very broke of course we have to admit we are a very broke country mm -hmm. or the government is broke and i think what the president is trying to uh, that's the same the same way as put is that you, you know that corruption in parliament and how mps are being bribed and a lot of things like that i think the greed that is is um, most likely to happen here is that uh, will, will, will they be doing things out of the, the public interest mm -hmm. or will it just for their benefit? Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Okay. I think political satire can't be underrated <laughs> right. uh, in, in giving another dimension to an issue that is, uh, you know, uh, of, public uh, of public interest. interest and of course current. Of course the current issue here is the, the idea of uh, this parliament that is supposed to be an oversight body and uh, that is supposed to censure and uh, you know and more or less pass these things that uh, are important to the uh, public. Uh, what would be their response at this point in town? Would they be out to cover their self-interest and like Dr. Sam says they'll be affected too. Maybe they go against it so that they're not affected or will they be a part of it to just make sure that the packs they expect are uh, more intact, or less they're left for, intact. Yeah. All right, and they're going to wind up the newspaper review right there. But do stay with us right here on Morning Express. I still have the same panel going in for Newsroom. And today we'd like to look at, uh, well, news behind the sensational uh, headlines. Sometimes the headlines are very sensational, but what happens after that? Is there a follow-up? That's one of the things we're going to be tackling right here. I know one of the things we've not looked at is uh, the recent Pumwani incident with Mike Sonko, and we're going to be weighing into that. But uh, it is now just about five minutes to uh, seven o'clock. We're going to take a short break and also release our KTN Home viewers for different programming to begin on KTN Home. But here on KTN News, we take a short break. We come back with the newsroom.